Hello humans, cephalopods, and other sentient life forms. This podcast today is with Jonathan Balcombe, who is a scientist, author, and speaker. Jonathan holds three biology degrees, including a PhD in ethology, which is the study of animal behavior. He has published over 50 scientific papers on animal behavior and animal protection. I first became aware of Jonathan about seven years ago, when I read his book, Second Nature, which makes the case that animals, once viewed only as mindless automations, actually have rich sensory experiences and emotional complexity. Though this podcast is a little shorter than normal, I really enjoy talking with Jonathan. He's full of incredible animal anecdotes and pushes a powerful argument for higher respect and treatment of animals. All right, well, should we just, should we dive dive straight in? Yeah, go for it. All right, perfect. Yeah. So uh, you yourself were raised in New Zealand, I read on your biography, for, for part of your life. That's right. At age three, we my family left England where we were all born to uh, live in New Zealand. We stayed there for five years in Auckland and then uh, moved to Canada, Toronto, Canada in 1967 when I was eight. Oh, wow. So you've, you've lived in all the all the areas of the world. Yeah, I was uh, well-traveled by the time I was 10. I'd, I'd circumnavigated the world, crossed the uh, international time zone on a on a ship, and, uh, you know, a seasoned traveler. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's brilliant. <laughs> and you're currently the director of Animal Sentience with the Humane Society Institute for Science and Policy, I believe. That's right. That's, uh, <laughs> I'm proud to say I, I, I not only have a very long job title, but uh, perhaps the first one with the word sentience in it. Yes, yes. It's super, super fascinating. Um, do you think you could loosely define sentience? For Yes. yes. Yeah, it's important to define that because sadly it's still a word that most people are not familiar with, which is it's uh, impo- surprising in a way because it's such an important concept. Sentience is the capacity to feel really. If you are a creature that can feel something, emotions, pain, pleasure, sensations, senses, sensory experiences, doesn't have to be all of those, although I suspect if, a, if an animal can feel one of them, they can probably feel them all, uh, then that qualifies you as sentient. Mm-hmm. Okay, and what, um, what would you say the complexity of a life form would have to be to gain sentience, like, where, do we know exactly where it starts to creep in? Yeah. Um, you know, we could talk about where to maybe draw the line. I always tell people to, you know, draw that line in pencil because new scientific information is constantly causing us to want to revisit uh, old assumptions, you know, about yeah. what creatures can feel and can cannot. Um, there's so, uh, there was, I mean, there was a time, in fact, it may still be the case that many people still think that any animal without a backbone cannot feel anything. And that, that assumption has pretty much gone out the window now with lots of good evidence that uh, cephalopod mollusks, that is uh, octopuses and squids mm. and nautiluses and, and members of that group, um, have emotions, they have awareness, consciousness. Certainly some level of consciousness is a prerequisite for sentience. If you don't to, to be able to feel something, you have to be, you have to know you're feeling it. You have to, you have to, well, I mean, that's my perception. I mean, one could argue that, and there probably are some academic arguments about that. But, but um, to feel something, there has to be some spark of awareness to be experiencing it. And, and ex- the, the word experience kind of implies the, well, it does imply the capacity to, to experience, the capacity to register something in a conscious way. Mm-hmm. And would we have, uh, sort of an example of a life form that like maybe maybe the, the most basic life form that would have uh, sentience um well you know we, <laughs> it's tricky we, that, that, the, yeah, it's tricky because <laughs> uh, you know we, we tend to be very hierarchical in our thinking we, we like to think of 
pyramids and hierarchies and of course we we tend to put humans at the top and it's 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 really it's really much more complicated than that i mean maybe in terms of uh technological intelligence musical intelligence humans belong at the top mm-hmm. in terms of uh, certain other kinds of perceptual and uh phys- physiological skills athleticism um uh, t- timing, the acute timing. I mean, a bat can register, can tell the difference between echoes coming back through their echolocation system to the to the billionth of a second. I mean, we can't do anything nearly that much. So there's various kinds of intelligence uh, intelligences and cognitive and sensory capacities out there, and it's just it's just sort of a bit comes up a little short when we just think of who's the best, who's 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 the smartest and all that. It's much more complicated. Uh, beyond that, of course, um, you know, how important is intelligence to questions of ethics and morals? So that wasn't part of your question. But uh, to get back to your question, you know, I, I guess most people would think of invertebrates as being uh, closer to the to the uh, edge of the, wherever that line would be mm-hmm. uh, as to who's sentient and who's not. I mean, I, I watch ants crawling about on a plant, uh, and I watch them panicking when they see a little fly flying over them. The fly wants to lay an egg on them because it's a parasitic fly. I was watching that just outside my apartment two days ago. Okay. I, you know, to look at that panic, and, and panic is really the, the most suitable word that comes to me in those ants, it's really it really stretches my imagination to try and envision that they're not sentience in some way mm-hmm. that they're not reacting in a conscious way and we're very presumptuous in assuming that a, a little ant because of its tiny size cannot be cannot have have that cannot have some level of experience so so it's it's a thorny question it's a challenging question it's an exciting question because um it's it's not completely close to science it's not close to science at all mm-hmm. it's it's of course we we may never know we probably can never know exactly what it's like to be an ant any more than we can know exactly what it's like to be a bat but now with new studies for instance using a frequency mri machines fmri machines magnetic resonance imaging brain scanners there are studies showing how dogs certain parts of dogs brains light up in emotive situations such as when they're anticipating a treat or a or a praise from their human guardian that shows that their brains light up in ways very much similar to the way our brains light up in uh, when we go in those machines and report what we're experiencing so there are scientific ways to probe these interesting questions about mm-hmm. emotional experiences about who's who's sentient who's not what kind of sentience are they having what kind of experiences do they have mm-hmm I'm just uh, I'm just curious for because it's it sort of comes down to ethics at the end, end of the day um, if uh, if vegans and vegetarians are um, they don't want to eat anything that's that's sort of sentient and that's actually a very um, valid ethical argument I'd say but it's just one I'm just curious if there's like a middle ground between I mean we'd probably both agree that plants are probably not sentient. And then we'd probably both agree that like a small mammal is, it's like, is there somewhere in between where the sentience just starts to creep into to the, to the animal <laughs> form, you know? Uh, yeah, I mean, yes and no. It's, it's the, it's a tough <laughs> question. And I skirted, I skirted line. that question before, okay. <laughs> but uh, I would say it's somewhere between plants and uh, some group of invertebrates. Yeah, okay. uh, that, that there probably are simple animals, uh, you know, um, very, very simple animals. I'm tr- I'm struggling here to think of an example. I mean, like a you know, roundworms, a tardigrade <laughs> maybe, uh, a, a roundworm, a member of the nematode, which is a very successful group of invertebrates. And yet even then, you know, I, the jury's out. I wouldn't want to make too many assumptions. <laughs> no. As for plants, um, I think think uh, yeah it's pretty clear that that they're not sentient in the way that we think of sentience as being now there's this popular best-selling book the hidden lives of the hidden life of trees mm. uh very nicely written uh, the, the author takes liberties in in terms of the language he uses to describe trees in a way that you might come away thinking they're sentient whether or not they're sentient it, it, it shouldn't change the respect that we should have for nature mm-hmm. and uh, the fact that sentient creatures rely on trees and rely on plants for their own survival uh, is all the more reason why we should be reverential and respectful and, and cautious about how we interact with all forms of nature mm-hmm. for sure 
Now your uh, your most recent book was um, was about fish cognition and fish emotional intelligence and all sorts of things. And you also did a couple of articles I read in Scientific American, I think the New York uh, New York Times or uh, New York Post or something. And you were talking about um, just to just to move up to an area where people may not be so uh, forgiving as, as far as emotions and intelligence goes, which is for fish. Um, you were talking about some some quite fascinating um, new discoveries about fish tool use. So maybe you'd like to... Sure. My book, What a Fish Knows, delves into a, a broad range of phenomena that are now scientifically shown that to be possessed by fishes, uh, cognitive skills, emotional abilities, social lives, sex lives, um, a, lot of, a lot of fascinating diversity and complexity in their lives, uh, including the, the unescapable conclusion that they are highly sentient there there maybe i shouldn't say highly sentient it, it doesn't it, i mean degree is sentience in degrees or is it an absolute i mean you, mm. you're either pregnant or you're not you're sentient <laughs> yeah. or you're not but yeah. but in, in any event the science shows that they are acutely in, intelligent and social in many cases and um, emotional and as for tool use it's just one of those many many uh, criteria that was once thought unique to humans uh, and has that's long gone by the wayside with with many 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 now examples known from the animal uh, kingdom or queendom if you prefer and um in terms of fishes it's it's now being documented food tool use many fishes use or some fishes use water as a tool to blow sand off the bottom for instance to uncover a, a food a, something to be eaten or water as a projectile such as archer fishes who shoot water squirt water through their barrel shaped mouths to catch insects uh, there's a nice video on youtube of a tusk fish an orange dotted tusk fish in palau indonesia who um blows water on the sand, picks up a clam, carries the clam very deliberately and purposefully towards a rock, a particular coral outcrop, which is then used as an anvil. Uh, the fish uh, repeatedly whacks r this this unfortunate mollusk against the rock with a series of, of well-coordinated and timed head flicks and releases to break it open to get the soft tissues inside to eat. That not only is sequential tool use with water and rock being used as tools, but also planning. It's quite clear watching this video that this fish uh, pretty much for sure has a goal in mind right from the outset and, and knows what he or she, and he, it's actually, a, a pair, I believe it is a he in this case, mm -hmm. and knows, but I'm sure females do it too. And, and the fish knows what he's going to be doing at the, from the outset and, and the chain of events it's going to follow. So it's a nice example of a, of um, not just tool use, but planning by uh, a fish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I uh, I will put a link to that video in the in the show notes for this. It's pretty. Yeah, I I checked it out um, through your link there, and it was yeah, it's pretty fascinating Good. to watch. Yeah, yeah, it is cool to watch. Yeah. Um, now I I first came across you because I got from my local library uh, your book Second Nature, which I loved and uh, read with a friend and, and she read it as well and loved it as well and uh, I remember in that that mean that book blew, blew me away with all these whole new kind of a whole new perspective on on animals but I remember in the book uh, that you criticized sort of uh, nature documentary makers um, portraying nature sort of red tooth and claw and I'm I'm that was like seven years ago when I read that book. So I'm I'm wondering if you think it's if it's improved recently or is is it sort of the same paradigm as it was then? I have to I have to chuckle hearing the question because well, uh, because I uh, I don't have a television, so <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. I'm not watching a lot of nature documentaries these days. <laughs> Um, what little bits I've seen uh, don't give me any great hope that it has improved much. Um, I, but I, but I, I honestly don't know for sure. I mean, the BBC is superb in what they do. Um, the BBC's work is great. Although, even there, um, there has been a tendency from some... In fact, British biology seems to have a bit of a tradition of presenting uh, nature as pretty harsh and cruel. Mm -hmm. I don't think David Attenborough falls too strongly under that under that maxim, but uh, Richard Dawkins has in the past. Whether he still does, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I, I've written two books about pleasure in animals, and in those books, I uh, I take pains, so to speak, to mm -hmm. to convince people or try to con persuade people to be, think of animals' lives as not just about avoiding pain and death, but about seeking rewards and pleasure. I mean, just some of the most basic life functions 
food, sex, shelter, comfort. Uh, these things are, um, are are great sources of pleasure. Many kinds of uh, many ways. There's many ways that wild animals can and do experience pleasure. And so we need to certainly be aware of the the trials of life. Uh, it's a fair phrase. I mean, there are lots of trials in life, in wild animals' lives as well as our own. Uh, but there's also lots of rewards in living that life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, I haven't. I mean, I haven't been kept, keep, keeping on with the trends either, but it seems like people are getting a bit more aware. It's it's not that people are so surprised when uh, new behaviors come out with, um, with 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 a whole bunch of animals. It seems to be becoming a little bit more mainstream, at, at least from my perspective, and I, I hope so. Um, There's definitely an uptick in uh, in uh, the, um, the the awareness we have and the information available. Yeah, yeah. In, about about animals lives being much more nuanced and complex than we, was once thought that yeah. that's definitely a, a significant trend that we're seeing yeah yeah and that's great i uh, i'm wondering if we <coughs> might if you know a little bit about uh cif- are they called cephalopods octopuses and uh-huh, a little bit yeah yeah um i read uh it was in the guardian um a 2010 experiment confirmed anecdotal reports that cephalopods are able to recognize and like or dislike individual humans and even those that are dressed <laughs> identically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, that's right. I mean, uh, it's, it's something that I remember first reading and hearing about in a lecture at a conference in Canada in the mid-1990s. Uh, actually, I think actually earlier than that. And uh, that was... Um, that was by a Canadian biologist, uh, Jennifer Mather, I think is her name. I know her name's Mather. I was struggling with her name. In any event, uh, octopuses are certainly getting a lot of attention these days. They've been uh, protected by in humane law, in a humane law in England for over twenty years, mm-hmm. and um, uh, but uh, they are horribly treated by humans in general worldwide, particularly in parts of Southeast Asia where they're often eaten alive and that sort of thing. But um, yeah, there are new books like Soul of an Octopus by Cy Montgomery, um, Other Lives by Peter Godfrey Smith. Uh, those books present show that these animals uh, are, have personalities, that they that they're individuals. They can hold a grudge. They can uh, they have good memories. They learn well. Uh, they want to play. They they problem solve. All sorts of things. And what's really great about that, and this is really brought through nicely in the book Other Minds by Godfrey Smith, is that it's pretty obvious that that they're conscious. And that means that consciousness evolved separately at least twice. Mm-hmm. Probably. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. we kind of assume that there are there are you know, there's a there's a long enough gap in the origins of humans and octopuses. As an evolutionary biologist, I completely support the notion that we have a common ancestor, but that's a long, long way ago. Mm-hmm. And um that common ancestor is generally assumed not to have been conscious, which means that further up the tree when octopuses and, and our our ancestors were separate consciousness evolved independently in those two groups yeah, and um, perhaps other groups as well but yeah that's a pretty mind-blowing no pun intended pretty yeah. mind-blowing uh, notion that uh and it speaks to a couple of things one is the incredible creativity with which evolution finds ways to solve problems and two how useful consciousness is the fact that it mm-hmm. would evolve independently it's similarly for flight flight is extremely useful it gets you around quickly uh, and flight has evolved uh, at least three times or is it four times independently certainly uh, bats birds and insects are three major groups that wow. all evolve all evolve flight independently without a common ancestor who could fly so that's another illustration of how really if there's a, if there's a really useful thing to be able to do uh, there's a good chance that evolution will find a way to do it and I, that was poorly worded because it implies that evolution has a purpose in mind that evolution <laughs> has a goal in mind and that's that's fundamentally not the case nevertheless uh, evolution um will exploit new niches, new living spaces, uh, and will find ways to, uh, again, I'm not wording it right, <laughs> but, uh, but it suffice to say that animals, uh, and evolution is a great problem solver, you could say, in hindsight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the differences between an insect and a bird and a bat wing, if you just look at, look at them completely superficially, mm. is, is quite remarkable. So. Yeah, yeah right, it's, hugely it's, different, that's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, so com- all these... There's an incredible tendency for, to complexity. Uh, it seems on uh, with as time goes on, the the life forms seem to get more complex, and in the most. By the way, Ryan, yeah, 
Yes, that's right. Uh, that, that is a trend, and we can come back to that. Uh, but I just wanted to point out, Ryan, I, I'd forgotten, there, there is a fourth uh, flying group, and that was the, the now extinct flying reptiles, the uh, pteranodons. Ah, of course. Yeah which have gone extinct, sadly. None of the living reptiles today fly. Yeah. But, um, yeah. but yes, I, I just back to the point you just made, there is certainly a trend through time of increasing complexity, um, but even that is not uh, written in stone, so to speak. The, depending on circumstances, complexity can become reduced, such as mm -hmm. uh, an example I've given before is blind cavefishes whose ancestors could see uh, but through uh, certain populations of these fishes being isolated in caves where it's dark all the time, no light, and therefore no point in, in developing eyes because it's costly to develop them, and you can't mm -hmm. see anything anyway because it's dark. dark. Uh, they, through time, lost that because individuals in the population who didn't waste energy developing eyes had a slight reproductive exam advantage over those who, who did develop eyes, and therefore they were, through time, generally favored in the population. Natural selection for a reduced complexity. Mm -hmm. I imagine when you have a certain ecological sort of uh, ceiling, then you're only going to fill as much space as, as possible um, with, with whatever evolutionary uh, resources are available. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, that's that's true. It does make sense, um, and yet um, through time, I mean, uh, there, there's so many uh, pot potential niches that is living spaces to possibly exploit. I, mm. I happen to be doing quite a bit of research on flies right now. Flies being pretty much undisputedly now the new champions of of order level diversity of, of organisms on earth there are more kinds of flies than there are beetles or any other group of animals oh, okay. so um, and one of the reasons for their success is that they are uh, they are very good at finding specific very 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 specific ways to make a living there are flies who who breed in the dung of, of, uh, of land snails, for instance, of a particular species. That may actually not be tr true, but I know that there are some, some kinds of snails that they, that they uh, parasitize or they feed mm -hmm. on their waste. And um, there's just so many little tiny micro niches, you could say, where they, mm -hmm. where they, where they can live. And so that's another trend we tend to see through um, the history of life is increased, not just increased complexity, but increased diversity. Mm -hmm. But yes, I think back to your point, uh, there, there has to be a limit on a, on a finite system. The Earth is fundamentally finite. It's a single planet. So there is a limit on that. And it could be that there are ups and downs in in the diversity of living spaces that we see on Earth, depending on, mm. say, climate trends and, 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 and weather patterns through time. I mean, I'm sure the diversity of life on Earth, it's pretty clear, has has gone up and down during the great mass extinctions through history. So, yeah. so it doesn't always increase. And often through, and the, of course, through temperature, right? The warmer, peri the warmer periods, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then you know, big uh, you know, like a big asteroid hitting the Earth, which is, uh, I, I believe, the leading theory to explain the disappearance of the dinosaurs. Of course, when you have collapses like that, you also have huge openings of opportunities for new species to mm -hmm. to colonize. Mm -hmm. Of course, yeah, yeah. Uh, I wonder if you, uh, I, I mean, you've covered a lot of mammal and and other animal uh, sort of emotional emotions and intelligence, and now you've covered you've done a huge amount of research into fish. Uh, I'm curious on your thoughts on reptile intelligence. Um, I remember a video that was going around the the internet a few years back of. Uh, a man that had rescued a crocodile uh, from a gunshot and nursed the crocodile back to health. And there's videos of him playing in the river with a fully grown crocodile. Uh, and it's clear play. And the guy, there's many different instances of him playing with this crocodile. And the crocodile absolutely means no harm. And he reported that the crocodile followed him home after he took him back and, and they became good friends. So <laughs> I'm curious if, you, if you've done much research into, into reptiles and uh, and their emotional and in intelligent uh, capacity. I've seen uh, some of that footage as well. It's quite striking. Yeah. Uh, I actually have a, a colleague, um, a guy named Vladimir Dinitz, who's at the he's Russian biologist, but he's now at the University of Tennessee, and he, he's arguably the world authority on the crocodilians. Oh wow! Uh, having having spent six years traveling the world studying all twenty six or twenty eight species, depending on who you ask, of crocodilians around the world. And uh, he's already published, I don't know, he's got to be at least 10 or a dozen or more 
probably 15 or more papers, academic papers on various phenomena that we would never have associated with crocodilians, such as tree climbing, uh, sexual orgies, cooperative <laughs> hunting, wow. um, you know, child rearing. And I mean, a remarkable array of, of phenomena that we just uh, sort of playfully sliding down uh, mud banks and yeah, that we just never would have associated with these, uh, you know, humorless, primitive, cold-blooded uh, reptiles, the kind of, I, I don't really mean those last phrases. Those are just yeah. the terms we typically associate with them. So, yeah, for sure, reptiles are another area, another group of animals, just it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a recurring trend. We underestimate them. We treat them abysmally. Um, and there is a connection between those two things, although not, not a clear one. Mm -hmm. And, and then we, when, when science starts to ask better questions and delve into their lives, we discover we've had it all wrong. They're, they're much more complex. It's definitely a subject I, I would consider. I've thought about possibly, uh, writing about in future. Mm -hmm. Um, and the information on, on them is just accumulating at an increasing rate, which makes it a great topic for somebody to write about. Yeah, absolutely. It seems like the, the the gap that you have in your in your series of the animals at the moment. Um, uh -huh. uh, I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind sharing uh, a few of the more surprising. I mean, your your book is full of the most incredible anecdotes of animal behavior from all sorts of different animals. Um, I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind sharing a couple of a uh, couple that are sta particularly stand out um, to you, or ones that you're, you're remembering off off the top of your head. About animals in general, or just fishes? just oh, just general animal, uh, maybe maybe some of the more surprising or um, or incredible animal anecdotes. Um, let's see. So so with with fishes, since I've been writing about them more recently, mm -hmm. uh, there's um, I guess w one that that's really quite pretty pretty special and pretty pretty neat and pretty mind blowing is the is the interspecies. In communication and, and cooperation that goes on between groupers and moray eels on reefs. These are two large predators. They have different hunting styles. Uh, you know, morays are like ferrets. They can swim into the matrix of the reef and pursue fishes through tight spaces, whereas groupers are big and chunky, so they kind of stay on the outside. They rely on speed and stealth to catch prey. And uh, groupers will communicate with mores they will invite them to go hunting with them with a, with a head shaking gesture so it's a gesture it's also a referent what a, what would scientists would call a referential signal uh, because it's referring to a later event it's referring to something that's going to happen in a different time a little bit later and in a different place over there on the reef and then if the moray is in the mood and or hungry um, presumably recognizes the signal and swims off together with the with the grouper and you can watch YouTube videos of this phenomenon it's been quite well studied now and uh, they wow. proceed to hunt cooperatively and the moray you know if, the, if they chase a fish into the reef the moray will go after it and if the moray catches it great the moray gets a, gets a meal uh, but if the fish escapes into the open water the grouper is waiting on the outside wow. uh, so uh, and yeah observational studies show that their per capita success rate it getting food is about can be up to five five times higher okay. when they hunt cooperatively than if they hunt individually. Yeah, because there's really not much of an option for the unfortunate fish targeted by them. Groupers also will point to the reef where a fish has escaped uh, to try to signal to the nearby moray that hey, you know, come on over here. There's somebody here. Mm -hmm. So and they'll even go and fetch them. So it's um. It's behavior that's interspecies. It uh, involves referential signaling, which is very rare, so far very rarely documented among non-humans. Mm -hmm. And it's in fishes. It's in a group of animals that we've just assumed are kind of asleep at the wheel, and they're just not. And, and it's just uh, it's an illustration of just how up there they are, how sophisticated they can be in their in their lifestyles. Yeah, that's incredible. Um... I mean, are there any other examples of that on land animals apart from humans and wolves or humans and dogs? I think the only examples are um, are possibly some great apes. Uh, a couple of great ape studies may show that, but uh, it, I don't know if there's any other groups that have been shown to have that that oh. kind of referential communication. And and even in the great apes, it's not it's not across species. Yeah, it's yeah. usually within the, within the same species. Um, let me speak to a recent animal study. Uh, I haven't been in that domain recently of non, non fish studies. I have a whole library in my notes and in my <laughs> books and it's stacked away somewhere in my brain. But, uh, just one study that I read about recently that I think is pretty cool is studies showing 
regret, which is a pretty interesting emotion because to regret something, you you also kind of need to have a sense of time. You need to have a sense of the past um, and maybe even the future in the sense that I'm regretting it because I could have had this in the future when I, now I can't. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, how do you just study regret in, in an animal like a rat? And of course, r- rats... Rats are fabulously sophisticated and, and smart and emotional mammals, partly because they've just been studied a lot more than most other animals. Mm-hmm. The, the chances are if we study the other animals at the same level of, of detail that we study rats, we would find that they too are pretty amazing in what they do. But anyway, um, this guy set up this, uh, this, this apparatus where, where there were different kinds of food rewards some liked more than others, uh, like a chocolate versus a raisin, at the end of spokes on a wheel in a four four spoke wheel uh, apparatus, and the 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 trigger that, that that accompanied the food was a sound, a tone, and by there each type of food, if I remember the, the design correctly, each type of food had a different tone, a different sound that played when the rat went down that arm of the spoke, mm-hmm. um, and uh, the scientist or there was a random generator that could control the length of the time. The, the amount of time the, the sound made. And so um, if the animal got, with the sound was taking too long and the animal couldn't access the food until the sound was over, I guess that's an important part of the design, mm-hmm. uh, then sometimes the rat would abort that spoke and just go to the next one. And um, if it was a, a lesser reward in the next one, uh, the rat would, on being able to access that reward, would look back wistfully sometimes at the previous <laughs> yeah. one. If it was a, if it was a better reward, there. I, I'm not describing the design very well, but no, you kind of get the I, I, gist. I totally get the idea. Yeah, and I can, I can yeah. just see it happening. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's very clever, very clever of scientists to come up with these study designs. It takes a lot of creativity, and I admire scientists for being able to do that. I hope that they treat the rats well, and they don't always do that. But in any event, it, regret is a, is a, just an, just a one of many types of emotion that are, um, you know, being found to be present in non humans. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, I wonder if we could go to ethics really briefly before we go, but yeah, sure. Um, my friend, uh, a friend of mine who also is part of the podcast, um, has a question a bit more technical. Um, he says, uh, do you think that a formalized population ethics is necessary or desirable for work on animal welfare? What is so what is that meant by, by population ethics? Yeah, that's what I asked him. And I think he's, <laughs> I think he, I guess he's meaning um, like some sort of a cap on population of animals being produced um, to try and increase the welfare of the whole um, I'm not really sure. <laughs> is, this, is this possibly referring to the production of animals as food? Yeah, I, I suppose. For humans? Is. Yeah, well, I mean, if that's the case, then, uh, then you know, that, that's a huge issue. The, the animal agriculture is easily the, the biggest contributor to animal suffering and death, and certainly of human hands mm-hmm. worldwide. I mean, the numbers are staggering. 60-plus billion land animals estimated killed by humans every year. I mean, just in the United States here alone, 300 chickens per second die at our hands for food production. Yeah. And fishes, the numbers are possibly into the trillions So every year. So the numbers are just uh, astonishingly staggering. Uh, not only is it, is it, in, is it um, in terms of wild animals, which is most of the fish is being caught and eaten, they're actually wild, not even domesticated, unlike farmed animals on land. Um, the, the population effects, of course, for them are... are, are very very large and damaging but also just the uh, the conditions that most of these animals the ones reared in captivity are kept in are, are really appalling and miserable so huge ethical issue there i mean that that's that's just it's not seen and presented by modern news as a, as, a, as one of the big ethical issues but it's arguably the biggest ethical issue on the planet in, in the history of the planet in term if we realize that animals can suffer and feel pain just as intensely as we can mm-hmm. just the numbers alone indicate that this is a, a monstrously huge ethical issue and it just isn't being treated at that level yet i say yet because it is a growing issue and the connections are now being drawn finally between animal agriculture and climate change and and issues that are directly affecting us and causing us to to wor- start worrying. So um, I'm actually hoping that hopeful that uh, that that connection will help to hasten our change in our behavior towards plant based diets and towards a uh, much more respectful treatment of animals. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. I, I know. I realize you have to go uh, basically now. So I'm wondering if maybe we could finish on. 
a slightly uh, lighter note. Um, what's your opinion on, uh, what do you think of sloths? I love them. I love all animals. <laughs> I've never actually met a pers- sloth in person, but I've seen enough YouTube videos that I adore them. <laughs> uh, and, I, and I just feel a great deal of empathy for an animal who moves so slowly and, um, and has parasitic moths that live on their butts. <laughs> But who knows, maybe they like that. But maybe, uh, yeah, sloths are cool. Get... I hope I get to see one one day. Yeah, me too. Uh, and finally, um, do you have any good uh, uh, vegan recipe websites or, or nice, less known vegan food that you might better recommend? Uh, I do enjoy being in a kitchen and preparing vegan food, uh, and I have some good cookbooks, but uh, I don't spend any time on websites for finding recipes. <laughs> but, okay. Um, uh, you know, I have some favorite books. Vegan Planet is a good one. Uh, La Dolce Vegan, those are a couple of my favorites. Okay, great. And how can people find you and your and your work just through your website? Is there anything? Any yeah, Jonathan, uh, J- JonathanBalcom.com or Jonathan-Balcom.com. Um, I'm active on Facebook. I have a, a personal author page as well as a Water Fish Knows Facebook page. Uh, I do tweet from time to time. So, yeah, people can look me up on my website. And uh, I also do a monthly newsletter called All Things Fish, which uh, I'm happy to welcome new subscribers and people can subscribe through my website. Brilliant, brilliant. Thanks so much for your time, Jonathan. I apologize for the time zone uh, issues. And uh, yeah, um, wish you all the best. And I'm looking forward to reading some more of your, more of your work in the future. Thanks, Ryan. I, I enjoyed it. Thanks so much, man. Take care. Bye-bye. Take, take care as well. Bye.